Well, welcome to the book of Isaiah. This is the book that Jesus trusted, that Jesus believed, that Jesus quoted and used in his ministry. And this book offers us an example of how each of us as believers should trust the Bible, God's word. Do you really believe the Bible? I hope so. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Jesus shows us how we can know God's plan for us, for our life, for the future, and, and how we can help all those we know and love to understand him better. Jesus believed the Old Testament book of Isaiah was true. Do you? It's such a joy that you're joining us in this course, going through the book of Isaiah. John Barnett here, down in our virtual classroom, primarily teaching this class, those of you that are tuning in on YouTube or something, this class is actually being beamed into a Bible Institute in East Asia, where there's a whole classroom of young people preparing as Asians to reach Asia with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But all of us are coming along with them, and I hope that you'll join us by taking your Bible and open with me. We're going to start, because this was Jesus' favorite book, in the Gospel by John. So look in the Gospel by John, chapter 12, and verse 41, and the emphasis that I just want to repeat and repeat and repeat, and I pray that each of you will grab hold and, and lay hold and understand this truth, that Jesus believed Isaiah. Every word, every doctrine, every amazing historical fact, he believed they were true. But do you? Look what John, the Gospel by John, records about Jesus. It says in verse 41, these things Isaiah said. Now Jesus is quoting Isaiah chapter 6, and it's one of the key chapters we're going to see in just a moment of the whole book. But Jesus quotes from Isaiah 6. And then look what it says in verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his, that's Jesus, glory, and spoke of him, that's Jesus. Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus Christ. So in Isaiah 6, the high and lifted up one on the throne is the pre-incarnate Christ. And Jesus knew Isaiah. Isaiah saw Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. And Jesus believed the book of the Bible we call Isaiah. And by the way, he believed all the rest of the Bible, and that's the number one reason why I believe the Bible. Because Jesus believed every book of the Old Testament, and Jesus picked the apostles and the associates of the apostles that recorded the New Testament, and Jesus said that his word was truth. So we can believe the Bible too. As you look at your slide, that picture is actually of the synagogue in Nazareth. This hour, we're looking at the trustworthiness of the scripture. The next hour, at when a society abandons God, then how God reaches an ungodly culture, and the person, the Messiah, who fulfills all of God's promises. Uh, then we get a preview of Revelation in the fifth hour the, about the wrath of God and when God pours that on the earth. And then we see one of the furthest back into history reaching events, and that's how Lucifer became Satan. Our seventh hour, we're going to look at justice and sin in the world and how God responds and why he takes so long sometimes to respond. And then hour eight is just a fascinating study of Hezekiah, the nation of Assyria, and one of those angelic monsters, the destroyer from the pit. In the next slide... We're going to look at the nature of inspiration, uh, how we can trust the Bible, and uh, the effect of the Word of God, our 10, theology, and the character of God, prophecy, the purpose of prophecy, and the map God left, our 12, uh, the most important chapter in the Bible, most likely, Isaiah 53, and salvation, and then the compassion of God we see in our 13. We're going to get a glimpse into paradise as the Creator returns, rules, and restores in that section of Isaiah. And then finally, we're going to really step back and look at how God wants us to listen to Him every day in His Word. Well, 
that page you see next on the slides is, is what my Bible looks like. And uh, I'd like to just read to you from the scriptures. Uh, you see in verse 3, I underline, and it says, The ox knows its master, uh, the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know and consider me. Uh, this is just what my Bible looks like right now. What I'm encouraging you to do as you take this course is to have a Bible, a paper Bible. It's great to use an electronic Bible. You, you see I'm using electronics all over the place. But a paper Bible uniquely captures, as we're reading, the moment as we read it. Because you notice there's all different color ink. I can see four different colors of ink just on this page right there. Each time I read the Bible, I interact with it. I, I ask God to open my eyes and to illumine my heart to his word. Then I ask him to teach me. And then I always pause and ask him to apply into my life what I learned. And by the way, that's what is in class zero. This is class one. Class zero, and if you haven't yet done that class, that's actually the first class of this course. And it talks about how you should consider journaling. Uh, this is my journal. In that class, I share how to find truths, how to um, record them in your, in your study, and then how to write a prayer of application. But as you are going through this, this class, I hope you'll mark your Bible. Back down at the slides, uh, this is an outline of the book. For those of you taking this course for credit, uh, this outline will be a part of your final exam and your quizzes. And what you need to know is the two parts of Isaiah. Uh, the first 39 chapters uh, are about our mighty God chastening his people. And then from chapter 40 on is our merciful God comforting his people. And so those two elements, uh, just the, the reality that uh, God has uh, kind of like a two-part message in Isaiah. Uh, the, the first 39 chapters are much like the Old Testament 39 books, kind of about judgment. And then the, the next 27 chapters of Isaiah, remember Isaiah has 66 chapters, and 39 in the first half and 27 in the second half. But much like the New Testament, um, the promise of restoration and salvation and then all the blessings of the future. So I hope that uh, that outline um, will, those of you that are enrolled, uh, that's in your um, class notes. And those of you that are watching this online, you can just uh, take a screenshot and you'll have that outline of the book. Looking back at the slides, these are the key chapters and we're gonna be covering each of them in this course. Uh, the Throne of God, uh, chapter six with uh, Isaiah's cleansing, the incarnation of Christ, uh, the fascinating uh, chapter about Lucifer's origin, then God's preview of the tribulation in 24 to 27, the greatest prophetic chapter in the Bible. Uh, that's uh, chapter 45 and the letter to Cyrus and, and the implications of that. The greatest chapter, not of prophecy, but in all the Bible, and that's Isaiah 53 about the substitutionary work of Christ. And then... Uh, the seventh of the key chapters are Isaiah 63 to 66 are all about the second coming and the millennium. And so I hope those chapters will become uh, a part of your study. Um, the next slide tells us about the magnitude of Isaiah and the Word of God. And I'd like to just uh, go over a, a few statistics. Um, Isaiah is the fifth longest book in the Bible. As I already said, it has 66 chapters. Uh, 1,292 verses, 37,000 words. But look at this. It's quoted to or alluded to 472 times in 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Let me repeat that. 472 times in 23 of the 27. So Isaiah figures prominently into God's Word. The next slide uh, is just a reminder that the book of Isaiah and all of its doctrines were 
believed and trusted by Jesus, Paul, John, Luke, Peter, and the early church. Now, look up from your slides for a second. Can I say that if Jesus and Paul and Peter and Luke and John and all the early church thought that the book of Isaiah was exactly what it says it is in your hands. Do you? Do you know the doctrines that are in this book? Just the book of Isaiah contains so many of the doctrines that are not currently held closely to by the modern Christendom churches. This book teaches divine Isaiah teaches divine inspiration. It teaches literal six-day solar day creationism. It teaches the origin of demons and fallen angels and Satan's realm. It teaches that God is going to bring the world to a climax in a, in a second coming judgment that has been preceded by this horrific tribulation time. And then it says God is finally going to do what Right now, during this COVID uh, lockdown, is so much in the news. Uh, did you notice that, that when people are locked down, they're not driving as much, flying as much, businesses aren't going? And so scientists are saying, wow, the, the environment is getting better during our lockdown. That seems to be a fixation of humans these days. Uh, we're always talking about climate change and how to fix the earth. Well, good news. Isaiah 65 and 66 is all about God fixing the earth. Only he fixes all of it once and for all completely. And that's called his return, his restoration, and his fulfillment of all of his promises to Israel and to us. But that's the book of Isaiah, as you look at that slide, and all of its doctrine was believed and trusted by Jesus, Paul, John, Luke, Peter, and the early church. In the next slide, I want to go through the 10 uh, key doctrines that we find. And, and I want you to think of what this study can do for you. Since Jesus completely trusted this book of Isaiah, so can we. And that means we can believe and understand the vast amount of authoritative doctrines that are contained in Isaiah. And you say, what are those authoritative doctrines? Well, number one, you see on the slide, Isaiah is an example of how the Bible quotes itself and affirms itself. So if you look up, I'm going to keep these over here on this side panel and keep referring to them. Why is Isaiah so vital? Because it was widely quoted. Now, the first reason why I believe the Bible is Jesus believed it. But the second reason I believe it is because the writers of the scripture totally believed that they were preaching and declaring and recording the word of God. So Isaiah is, is the most widely utilized book of the Old Testament in the New Testament, which is a, a constant reminder of the inspiration of Scripture. So Isaiah affirms for us inspiration. And remember, inspiration is the bedrock doctrine. It says in, in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you don't believe the Bible, how can you know that you have salvation? Because salvation is based on, as James said, receiving the implanted Word of God. What's the Word of God? The Word of God is what Jesus believed, and that's what you hold in your hand, and what the apostles and prophets, what the prophets wrote and the apostles quoted as they wrote the scriptures. Well, the next slide, number two, of the top 10 key reasons why Isaiah is so important to study. It's the salvation book of the Old Testament. Now, as you think about that, what, what, is it, what, what do I mean salvation book of the Old Testament? Well, statistically, if you study Isaiah, it contains more references to the doctrine of salvation than any other Old Testament book. 
Now the word, the actual word, salvation, that word occurs 33 times in the writing of the prophets. But of these, 26 of the 33 are in Isaiah. So not only inspiration, but salvation. And when salvation is described uh, 26 of the 33 times that it's by name described in the Bible, all in one place, you know you've kind of hit the gold mine, the, the mother load. Uh, you've found the, the rich vein of doctrine about salvation. And there, there's so many incredible verses about salvation. If you want to just uh, look in Isaiah with me, look at Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, and, uh, and most of these, uh, of course, I have them all marked and highlighted in my Bible, but it says in Isaiah, it talks about how we are, well, in verse 3, we don't know our master. Uh, we aren't following him. But the solution is in verse 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. And haven't you often heard this verse over the years as you've studied the Bible, been in church, heard about salvation? Verse 18, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be as wool. See, salvation, God's desire to make us cleansed and forgiven and right with him and secure is so beautifully described in Isaiah. Keep going to chapter 12 in your, in your Bibles, Isaiah 12. And it says, uh, verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength. He has also become my salvation. Now look at verse 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. I especially like that verse because... Uh, Let's see, this is October. So nine months and about a week and a half ago, so nine months and one and a half weeks ago, I was laying strapped down, totally conscious in this operating room and they were running a, a pipe up my arm and going in to repair my heart. Now, if you've ever had a, a, a stent put in your heart or had any type of uh, work like that done, it's unbelievable to be alive and to be looking at this wall size monitor where you're seeing your own heart and you can see this, this foreign device coming through your veins and going into your beating heart. I mean, it was just a remarkable. I would suggest it for everybody because it makes you realize how fragile you are, how temporal we are, and how great. Look at verse 3 is the wells of salvation. That's actually the verse I just kept repeating over and over in my mind because I thought, wow, either I'm going to come out of here with my heart repaired or else I'm going to be stepping in for the first moment of my life into heaven and seeing everything I've read about my whole life. Now, there's two things I'd like to encourage you from Isaiah 12, 3. Number one, if if you were dying today, do you know for sure you have the well of salvation? Do you have hope in Christ? Number two, if you're laying on an operating table or in an ER somewhere or in some accident trapped in your car, do you have verses memorized in your heart and mind that you can draw on, draw with joy, draw the water from the wells of salvation? That's the benefit of Bible study that leads to verse memorization that gives the great joy of meditation. You have to study in order to memorize, and you have to memorize in order to meditate. What a blessing, look at your slides, that this is the salvation book of the Old Testament, and we're going to cover that often. Number three, it's the primary source on the virgin birth of Christ. Uh, look up in your Bibles to uh, chapter 7. And Isaiah 7 and verse 14 uh, is the, the chief verse on the virgin birth of Christ. Isaiah contains the only Old Testament prophecy concerning the virgin birth of Christ. I'm going to read Isaiah 7 
and get to 14, and it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Doesn't that sound familiar? Uh huh. That's Matthew 1 in the New Testament. Matthew 1 and verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Back down to the slides. Isaiah is the primary source on the vital doctrine of orthodoxy called the virgin birth of Christ. Number four, it's, uh, Isaiah is also an amazing picture of the Bible's structure. Now, let me remind you what I mean of that. The Bible uh, has 66 books that were written by about 40 different authors. And those 40 different authors wrote over a 1,600-year time span uh, from Moses all the way through John. So Moses over here in about 1445 B.C. And the Apostle John is, we know, he's on Patmos in A.D. 90s. So that 1,600-year period of time is the span of the Bible. But the Bible comes to us in two parts. There are 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books. And how does the New Testament open? In Matthew, we hear a voice crying in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And we call him John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. And guess what? Isaiah, the book, exactly parallels the structure of the Bible. And you say, oh, is, is that really significant? Yes, because the first Isaiah 1 through 39 is all about judgment and, and sin. And starting in Isaiah 40, we have John the Baptist predicted in chapter 53, we have Christ on the cross. And in chapter 66, we have what's quoted in Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and new earth. So Isaiah is an amazing reminder to us of the plan of God, the structure of his word. Back in the slides, number five, the book of Isaiah is the best source of some of the Bible's greatest mysteries. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, take your Bible, and we're going to spend an entire class on this, but Isaiah 14 records for us the fall of Satan, starting in Isaiah 14 and verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, loose for son of the morning. Verse 13 and 14 talk about his five I wills, I will send into heaven. Basically, Isaiah is the source of some of the Bible's greatest mysteries. Isaiah contains the two furthest reaching events in all history. One of the most ancient events of all is the fall of Satan. That's in chapter 14. At the other end, the most future event is the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And that's Isaiah 66, 22. So Isaiah has those two furthest points that we can hardly even comprehend. Yet they're both captured in this one book. So back at your sides, Isaiah is the source of some of the Bible's greatest mysteries. Number six, Isaiah is the book uh, that, that totally emphasizes the doctrine of God in the Bible. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's, let's open in our Bibles to Isaiah 40. Because Isaiah 40 could be called a theology book. That one chapter... The 40th chapter is like a book of theology. And uh, you remember what theology means, theologia. It's the study of God. Uh, in Greek, theos is God, and logia is to study. So Isaiah is not only a chief source on inspiration and salvation, but on theology. And what we find in Isaiah is what we can call the attributes of God practically applied. I think that um, many people struggle with 
well, I've never been to seminary. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know Greek. I'm not a theologian. So, you know, I'm kind of don't want to say anything because I don't want to say anything wrong. That's a terrible idea. God says in 1 John 2 that he, his spirit anoints all believers. We all have an anointing from God. Now, I'm called by God, spiritually gifted, to be a Bible teacher. But all of us are called by God to be his ambassador. And all of us have the Holy Spirit who teaches us the Word of God. And many times, over the 40 years I've taught the Bible, I have gotten done teaching a group of people, and a, some sweet elderly person has come up to me, and after two or three sentences into our discussion, I realize that they know the Bible as well or better than I do. And they never have been to school. They've never been to seminary. They, they don't know ancient languages, but they sure do know the author. So what I'd like to encourage you is don't just casually read Isaiah 40. Now, part of this course is, remember, one of the course assignments that's in class zero that has all the assignments is you read the whole book of Isaiah. But don't just read it like, you know, you're reading labels in the supermarket. Read it like you're reading a love letter from your future wife or your current present, you know, wonderfully married to wife that you, you just savor every word. That's how we should read the Bible. Look at Isaiah 40. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak comfort in Jerusalem. Look at verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is the John the Baptist passage. Look at verse 6. In the middle, all flesh is grass. It's loveliness like the flower of grass. Verse 7. The grass withers, the flower fades because of the breath of the Lord blows upon it. But verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Look at this. Isaiah affirms inspiration. The word of our God stands forever. Now look at the theology. This theology of the attributes of God, or a better way to understand attributes is the character. See, don't, don't get bogged down by theological terms. Uh, they're only supposed to define truth. But character, we understand. People have character. Um, we, we kind of put people in categories. Uh, that person is loud. That person is boisterous. That person is kind. That person is patient. What is God like? Look at Isaiah. Uh, it says, verse 10, The Lord God shall come with a strong hand. His arms shall rule for him. Look at verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. Whoa. Let, let's just start listing some of these attributes. God is a shepherd. Wow. You know, Titus, the, the New Testament epistle of Titus, says that, that God is a shepherd who is a savior. You know, a lot of times we think of Jesus as our savior. Jesus is just revealing the invisible God who is a Savior. And Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is just revealing our invisible God who is a shepherd, like it says right here. Now keep reading in verse 12. This is more of the character of God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured the heavens with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in measure, and weighed the mountains. Wow. Wow. What, what is this saying? This is saying that our creator, because it's talking about the, the creator knowing how to balance the earth. By the way, that's a whole division of science. There's a, within science, within geology and astrophysics is this, this type of scientific thought called isostasy and geodesy. Geodesy. And this has to do with the balance of the Earth. Uh, did you know the Earth spins? It's round, but it has tall mountains, but it has ocean trenches that balance out so the Earth doesn't wobble. 
Those are actually branches of upper level science. But look what Isaiah says. Who's the one that's calculated the dust of the earth, measured the heavens, and weighed the mountains and the hills? See, it's our creator who is all powerful. I mean, no one, not even, you know, all those uh, fictional um, superheroes in all the movies ever claim to be able to hold the earth in their hand and measure it and weigh it. But it doesn't stop there. Um, it says in verse 15, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. Verse 17, they're like nothing. And then it talks about um, a little bit about idolatry. But look at verse 22 of chapter 40. He who sits above, what, what does your Bible say? The circle of the earth. And, and our great God sits above that and looks down on the earth. And what that tells us is that he is not only the creator, but he is all-powerful, omnipotent, he is all-knowing, he is, he's watching, he sees us, he's listening to when we talk. See, Isaiah is just filled with all of these truths about the attributes, the character of God. And, of course, we're going to spend an entire hour on that. Uh, number seven, as you look at your slides, not only is Isaiah a book on the doctrine of God in the Bible, it's also the strongest declaration of the doctrine of the Trinity. And I know that's important because, uh, let's turn to Isaiah 48. I do read uh, some of, uh, well, of course, all of you students' comments, but I also read uh, many of you online viewer comments. And I just saw one. They said, oh, please help me. I, I've come to trust Christ, former Jehovah's Witness, but I'm really struggling with the Trinity. I can't find that word in the Bible. And I thought, wow, you're doing a good job studying the Bible because uh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Did you know that? Neither is the word rapture. There are a couple of big important doctrines. But both of them are found in the Bible, but both of those words are theological terms. And Trinity is actually a contraction, you know, kind of like can't or won't. You know, it's a contraction where you leave out a few letters. Trinity is tri-unity. And they just take... Uh, and leave out the you and, and put it together. But the Trinity speaks of the character of God. There's one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And they're co-equal, co-eternal, and infinitely, eternally God. One God. God. When you get to heaven, you're not going to see three gods. There aren't going to be three gods walking around. There's God over there, God over there, God over there. There's only one God who eternally exists in three persons. And those three persons are co-eternal, co-substantial, and they are a mystery. But look at what Isaiah 48, 16 says. This is one of the key Trinity verses. And it says, come near and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that I was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. The Lord God is the Father. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit. And who's talking? Jesus Christ is talking in verse 16, and he said, the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. You see, that, that is one of many very clear verses in the Bible that affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. Look back at your slides. Uh, so Isaiah is the strongest declaration of the doctrine of the Trinity. Isaiah is also containing what I call the most important chapter in the whole Bible. And let's, let's go there. Turn over to Isaiah 53. 
And I hope I'm just whetting your appetite for this book, and I hope you can't wait uh, to read it. Um, wherever you're picking up with us, some of you, uh, I know, will watch later classes, and then you'll come back and start at the beginning and want to cover the whole thing. But most important, read your Bible with a pen in hand, with some way to mark, to remember, to note these fantastic verses, like I just said, that will help you as you, as you learn them to draw water out of the well of your salvation. But Isaiah 53, perhaps the most important chapter, I wrote this, Isaiah 53 is probably the most important chapter in the Old Testament as it is quoted from or alluded to 85 times in the New Testament. And that's why Jesus said that, and remember, I started with that. Jesus said that Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. When did Isaiah see his glory? Well, two times. Isaiah saw his glory in chapter 6, when he was high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. But even more gloriously, Isaiah saw him as the suffering substitute. And see, the suffering one is the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ that God the Father sent the Son and the Holy Spirit took the sacrifice of the Son and offered that sacrifice to the Father for the cleansing, and this is what the book of Hebrews is all written about, is the most crucial doctrine in the Bible. Because salvation is all that matters. Uh, salvation tells us that we are lost and separated from God by our sin, and there's no hope for us for the future. We're headed to destruction. Uh, like Luke says, we're all sitting on the edge of a precipice. We're blind by our sin, and we're tumbling headlong into destruction, and we don't even know anything because we're blinded, and the light. As uh, Luke calls him, Jesus, the sunrise from on high, the day spring. And he comes and shines his light on us and says, would you like to be set free from your sin? And he, the Bible says, he knocks. He knocks. He's within an arm's length, Paul said, of every human being on earth. Do you see what an arm's length is? See how close that is? If you were standing that close to me and I bumped you and you were blind, you would be able to grope. That means to reach out in the dark. And that's what Acts 17 says, that God wants every human being on this earth in the darkness of their sin. When he shines the light of conviction upon them, his grace, that they reach out and say, I want, I want to know you, creator. I want to know you, the one who, who is convicting me of my sins. And that's what salvation is all about. And that's what's in this incredible uh, doctrine of salvation that we have in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53. So, uh, in Isaiah, we not only have this uh, widely quoted salvation described virgin birth structure of the Bible for this mysteries theology trinity but we have chapter 53 which is the eighth but let's let's go to two more look back at your slides um, the most important chapter in the whole Old Testament and perhaps the Bible is Isaiah 53 number nine the best explanation of the powerful purpose of Bible prophecy and, I, and for that, would you turn with me to Isaiah 44, Isaiah 44, and I'll get there too. And this is what it says in verse 7. It says, uh, uh, well, verse 6, I'll start in Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. Now, what is that? That means that Jehovah's Witnesses are absolutely false doctrine because they say that in the beginning 
was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And what they say is there's the real God, and then there's Jesus, who's a God. And he's a lesser God. And he's another God, but he's not the God. And what does Jesus say? I mean, what does Isaiah record God says? I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there's no God. Keep going. And who can proclaim as I do? This is how God is telling you this is the verification that I'm God, the proof. This is my calling card. These are my credentials. Then let him declare and set an order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. Look at this. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. What, what is he saying? God says, I'm the only one that can predict the future with absolute 100% accuracy. Now keep going to verse 28. It says in 28, uh, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure. Uh, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Now, verse 28 means nothing to the average reader. But let me put it in context for all of you. Verse 28, Isaiah 44, 28, names a historic person, Cyrus, and says he is going to declare Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. Guess what? Jerusalem wasn't destroyed yet. Isaiah 44:28 was written 200 years before Cyrus was born. Who is Cyrus? He's the leader of the Persian people. He's, he's famous in, in museums around the world. Now, let me show you how important this prophecy is. It would be like someone, you know, this is uh, October of 2020. Um, October 2020. So it would be like someone in 1820. Uh, who was alive in 1820? Abraham Lincoln, okay? As my kids call him, Abraham Lincoln Log. You know, but Abraham Lincoln, uh, let's say in, in 1820, he said, Behold, Donald Trump, my servant, will do this or that. Donald J. Trump, as he calls himself. Wouldn't that be a remarkable thing? Now, in the current political. Yeah, I mean, that would make the news. Uh, even CNN would say something about it. That it was discovered that 200 years ago, Abraham Lincoln named a contemporary person, but not just named him. God says, 200 years before Cyrus's birth, that Cyrus was going to make the decree for the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem in their temple. This is the most, the single most remarkable, chapter 45, see this is the introduction, but chapter 45 is the, the single most important display of prophecy in the book of Isaiah and perhaps in the whole Bible. We're gonna cover that greatly because, I'll read it to you, um, God verifies himself by prophecy. Prophecy is a signature of God, and Isaiah makes the Old Testament's clearest prophecy about an individual. The Persian king Cyrus, by his decree, are both mentioned by Isaiah nearly 200 years before Cyrus was even born. Wow. Best explanation of the purpose of Bible prophecy is in Isaiah to verify God. And number 10, finally, the clearest archaeological proofs for the verification of the Bible. Number one, the Bible is verified as true. The picture you're looking at on that slide is a picture from the British Museum, and it's a powerful verification of the trustworthiness of the Bible. It's called, and if you could read the little tag that's down there in front, uh, it's called the, the prism of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, plus on the right in the picture are the arrowheads his vast army shot at the city of Lachish. Now, what 
this whole exhibit is about is the ancient world had a bully system and it was real straightforward. A nation would conquer a region, demand tribute, which was an annual payment, and if you didn't pay the tribute, they'd come and kill you. Now that's a simple system. Now look at the next slide. This is a tunnel. It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel. King Hezekiah refused to pay the tribute to the bully, so the Assyrians have invaded Judah. And archaeology unearthed treasures that reveal just what the Bible says about Hezekiah. And it's in 2 Chronicles, and it's in, of course, Isaiah. And that's a picture of the tunnel that Hezekiah, that's mentioned in Isaiah, and that he built. And look at this next slide. This is the very famous rock. It's called the Siloam Inscription. It was discovered at the end of Hezekiah's tunnel. It's described in ancient Hebrew script, the process of them digging. These, the, the little squiggly marks you see on that slide says that, that they dug and the two groups met and that they broke through and the water flowed. That's what it says in Hebrew. Now this, what you see on that slide, is actually from the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul. And the, the Turks, is, or the, the Ottomans, as they ruled the Holy Land area, chiseled that out of the tunnel and took it to their museum. Now the next slide is another thing mentioned. In 2 Chronicles 32.5, it says that Hezekiah enlarged the wall. Now look closely. On the left, upper left corner, you see playground equipment, and if you look on the right, upper right corner, you see people in black. Those are Hasidic Jews. This is the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, and you're looking down at an excavation that goes back 2,600 years, and that's the actual wall that the Bible says, a broad wall that Hezekiah built. Now, this next one is amazing. This is actually Sennacherib's prism, and the, the left uh, kind of sandstone colored thing is the prism. Then the circle with red around it, this is part of the cuneiform that refers to Hezekiah, king of Judah. And it begins on line 11 of panel 3. And this is what it says. You can read the slide. This prism contains six columns of text which the Assyrian king Sennacherib describes his triumph. Wow! There's an actual record right out of a museum of a historic person. Now this is an even better picture of that prism. And when we walk through Hezekiah's tunnel, when we gaze at the broad wall, when you observe Sennacherib's prism, which is in the British Museum, or when you try and read the Siloam inscription, one lesson should jump to the forefront of our minds. The Bible is verified as true. Now look at this. You can read it with me. You and I have faith rooted in history, not mystery. The words on the pages of the Bible you hold are supported by simple elements we can dig out of the ground. They prove nothing but support everything. How can we expect to believe parts of the Bible we can't verify, like faith, the Messiah, and heaven, if the scriptures are not also true in the natural realm? The Bible is not primarily a history book, but what it says about history is true. The Bible is not a science book, but what everything it says about science is true. This reality reminds us of what Jesus said to Nicodemus. If I told you earthly things and you didn't believe them, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly? With our own eyes, we can see Hezekiah's wall. I just showed you a picture. Hezekiah's tunnel. I just showed you a picture. And Sennacherib's prism. They are real. And so is our faith. This first class... The purpose of this class is what you saw in that last slide. Jesus believed Isaiah was verbally inspired, inerrantly true. Every word, the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures. And Jesus believed everything Isaiah said about salvation was true. And Jesus believed everything Isaiah said about theology was true. Do you? I hope that you will come in simple faith and bow before the great God that knows the future and say to him, increase my faith, help me to believe and trust and cling to and rely upon your word, which when I have it engrafted into my soul, saves me. 
eternally. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for Isaiah. What an exciting journey we're going to have through this book. Uh, what an exciting time unearthing all these doctrines and truths and character and prophecy. But I pray most of all that your spirit will be at work in each of our hearts, that we will begin to read and study, memorize and meditate your truth so that with joy we can draw water out of the wells of salvation. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.